right, now I'm really excited about this presentation. And uh, it was about a month ago that the San Francisco Chronicle, and on my staff I have a foodie, Carol Marx, who discovered this article and brought it to our attention um, for Connect. But the story ran in the Sunday food section about uh, impossible foods, and it's meatless patty. And we wanted to, uh, we actually talked to Impossible Foods about serving you meatless patties for lunch today, um, but we just couldn't work out the logistics, so just keep that in mind that uh, it's a meatless patty, it's a disruptive food, in any case, in the article, the company founder, Patrick Brown, explained that the idea originated during a sabbatical he took uh, from Stanford uh, University um, as a biochemistry professor. And uh, he took that sabbatical about six years ago. He set a personal goal, which was chase solutions to the most important problem in the world. He said, quote, I decided that the problem was the use of animals as a food technology, and that technology is by far the greatest threat uh, to the global environment. So here to tell us more, now they have, they've been all over the media. How many of you have heard, read stories on impossible foods in the media, or heard it on the news? Yeah. Not a whole lot. But anyway, uh, hey, hey, come on over now, here. Now you'll hear it. <laughs> now we're going to hear all about it, but we're really thrilled to have uh, Impossible Foods Chief Strategy Officer uh, Nick Halla with us today. Would you please give him a, a, a Redwood City welcome? Thank you. Thank you. You might want to say this. Yeah. Sounds good. Thank you for the nice introduction. And it's uh, exciting to be here in Redwood City, which is our home turf. We're just a couple miles down the road. And so we've been uh, here in Redwood City for almost four years now. So I'm going to tell, tell you a little more about what we're doing at Impossible. And that was a great introduction of what we've kind of just a high level grounding. But uh, I'll start out with a question, which I guess you already answered. But what is the biggest environmental threat to the world today? And it is animal farming, the way we use animals to produce food. A lot of people talk about the way we do transportation and moving to electric vehicles or autonomous autonomous, like that can take a lot of the impact of that system out, but I'll go through some statistics later. A lot of people talk about our energy production, but environmentally, if you look across the board, it's animal farming. In my background, that's the world I came from. I grew up on a small family farm in Minnesota, a uh, dairy farm, and saw the production from the, from the ground, and at a small point source, don't really see the impact nearly as much, but from a global perspective, it's huge. And then I worked at General Mills designing manufacturing systems and new products and could see how we could actually deliver food to billions of people across the world. But in those industries, very few people are ever really talking about what the actual impact was of these systems worldwide. So for animal farming today, a couple of statistics to remember is if you look at all the global livestock, the production covers 30% of the world's arable land surface not covered by ice. That's the size of North America and South America combined just to raise animals. And if you include grazing, it's 50%. 50% of all the land is used to raise animals for food for us. Uh, from greenhouse gas emissions, it's more greenhouse gas emissions than all transportation. Uses a quarter of the water supply. And the craziest statistic is species. So right now, there are 16 times more biomass of cattle than all, all living wild mammals left on Earth. 16 times. We're just squeezing everything else out just to produce food for us. And the worst part about this is the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization predicts that the consumption is going to increase by 70% by 2050 as population rises and middle classes want more rich foods like this. So how are we going to do this? And that's where Dr. Pat Brown took a sabbatical looking at as a biochemist. Can we do this? Are there ways we can create better solutions? And it's relatively simple. If you look at a cow, for every 33 calories a cow takes in, for every 33 grams of protein, we get one calorie and one gram of protein out. So as a technology, a cow is great at producing products that people love, but it's very inefficient. And if we go to the primary source, we go to the, anim go to the plant bases that they consume right away, we can pull the nutrients out of that system to recreate, a, recreate the products directly from plants with a small, tiny fraction of the impact that we have on the environment today. 
So when we started, it was an idea. And there's very few ideas in Silicon Valley that can actually have worldwide big changes really to global ecosystems, and this is one of them. Uh, the way we approach the problem is first we have to understand why does everybody out here love a juicy steak or mozzarella on your pizza? And when we understood the fundamental properties of what was driving that, then we'd go in the plant-based world and individually pick out the pieces that we need to recreate that. And I'll go through an example. If you look at flavor of meat, the flavor of meat when you put a burger on the grill isn't like you're smelling meat flavor. You're smelling hundreds and hundreds of different compounds that your brain will perceive as meat. So we need to understand what was driving that. What's causing that chemistry to happen as you cook? And it turns out it was very simple. There's one protein that drives all the flavor of meat. And it's a protein called heme. So heme is a protein that's in really a basic building block of all life. In us, it's in hemoglobin, in animal tissue and muscle, it's myoglobin. In plants and for like legumes, there's a protein called leg hemoglobin, and the heme is the same. We learned it's a great catalyst to create all that reaction, all that chemistry as you cook the same natural way as you do in beef. So in our product, we, we use leg hemoglobin, the same heme, to drive the chemistry of beef so we can replicate that product. Because one of the theses that we had when we first started was that the only way we're going to get mainstream consumers to switch over to a plant-based system is to deliver products that they love as much or more than meat. And so we decided a couple years in that the first product we would want to target is ground beef. It's a massive industry. It's iconic in American culture. You can do so many different products with it. And over the last few years, we've been developing that. And then we recently launched and had some press. And I'll kind of go through a little bit of that. Um, but it is a raw material. So like our ground beef today, um, our chef partners are making anything with it, burgers, uh, meatballs, and even tartare. We went to the Climate Change Summit in Paris to start thinking about this, because everything at the Climate Change Summit was around transportation and energy production, nothing on food. And all the food there was actually meat and dairy products. So they're really not thinking about it. And we wanted to start that conversation. So our chef that went out there with us was like, well, we need to make something French. So let's make tartare. And so we had a, like a cocktail hour, we're serving some appetizers, and we had a French woman come, come up and say that, I have tartare twice a week, and this is the best tartare I've ever had. And that's the only way we're going to change the system. So we recently launched in uh, four restaurants, uh, Momofuku Nishi in New York with David Chang, in San Francisco at uh, Jardinere with Tracy Desjardins, and at Coxcomb in the financial district with uh, Chris Constantino. And then also in LA at Crossroads Kitchen. And these are restaurants that are known for great food and great experiences. And they won't put something on their menu that they didn't believe was great food. And Chris, for instance, he is known as the meat guy of San Francisco. And this is a new type of meat. Cows make meat from plants. We make meat from plants just directly. Um, and we're just getting started. So our team is in Redwood City. We have about 130 people, still mostly on the science, engineering, development, looking at how can we create simple solutions from the plant-based world to do this. And we have a whole suite of products from the platform coming behind. Now that we're unlocking the tools to make ground beef, we can make steak, fish, chicken, cheese. And it's over time, it's like this is the only way we're really going to be able to feed the world effectively today and in 2050. So if there's Three things that I want to leave you with. One is this is a huge issue and it's very urgent that we have to solve it now. Two is the solutions are here. We, can now, we now have the abilities to make products directly from plants that are more nutritious, healthier, more cost effective, more scalable, and much, much better for the environment. And consumers are ready for it as well. And the third thing is every single choice that a consumer and you make can really have an impact. So our estimates from our externally validated life cycle analysis is that one quarter pounder that you'd replace from ground beef to us today would save a 10 minute shower's worth of water, 18 miles driving in a standard American car, and 75 square feet of land, just from one quarter pounder. So I'll, I'll open it up to a couple questions. I think I have a couple minutes. All right. Yeah. Can we, can we buy the product in, uh, at Whole Foods? Ah. Or? So eventually, yes. Not right now. So we, um, as we started looking at how what was the best way for us to go to market, 
We have such amazing chef partners really across the globe that want to help us deliver this message and story and help educating consumers with, the, with what we're doing and why it matters. We decided that for our brand, it's much better for us to build with the chef partners that are ready to work with us. But as we continue to scale, our intention is to be everywhere where meat is, grocery stores, direct delivery, um, fast food, restaurants across the board. Yeah. Um, how expensive uh, is the product compared to meat? So in the restaurant, oh, yep. So the question was how expensive is the product compared to meat? And so we are in four places today. So at uh, uh, Momofuku in New York, we're $12 for a burger and fries. This is in Chelsea. At Jardinier, we're $16. Uh, Coxcomb is a big, bigger, juicy, like more gourmet burger. It's 19 And I think at Crossroads, it is $16. So it's in that range. And over time, as we continue to scale, we, we believe we'll actually be much more cost effective than beef over the next several years. Yeah. Yes? Growing, how do you create the product? So the, the question was whether the technology is based on 3D printing. Uh, no, it's not. Really, the way we look at it is the fundamental building blocks that we need in the world already exist in the plant-based system. And there is a few parts that drive this. Uh, proteins are your big, our biggest scaffold, you would say, from that standpoint. You can create a lot of functions with proteins. Like from the food world I was in before at General Mills, it was like if we looked at protein, it was a nutritional category. I'm going to put 10 grams of protein into my bar, so now it's a high-protein bar. But if you actually, from a biochemist perspective, like Dr. Pat Brown, every protein has different functions. So we can actually use those proteins under conditions of heating, cooling, um, just mixing even, and they'll create the tissues like mozzarella that stretch as you, as you melt it. But there's no like, like 3D printing or anything like that. It's really standard food industry equipment from that standpoint. Just better ways of how to put the materials together. Yeah? What can a group like this do to make sure that you succeed? Ooh. Um, I think we're going to need supporters across the board as we continue to scale. Um, I think spreading the word right now is the biggest thing we can do. This is such an urgent issue, um, looking at how we can actually engage the community. Because this is like meat and food is such a cultural piece of the world. The more we can actually be part of those cultural conversations and get people thinking about this, I think the faster the system will change. So any ways that we can do that. We've had a, a more and more work with even like the school systems, for instance, as we were just talking about education. And like the young minds of this world are very open to change. And actually, they're looking for change like this. And now that we have solutions, getting people like that like intrigued and excited is really the next future leaders that we have or that are the ones who are really going to drive the change. All right. Well, thank you. If you have any questions, talk to me later. All right. <laughs>